This week, we go unlock the asylum with Tom Lazuka. In the Debonair Ideal segment this week, we talk music with our special guest host, Dave Burke. And in the Stogies of the Week, I go get some therapy while Dave comes back from La Mission. Powered by the G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island and broadcasting from Studio C in North Carolina, where cigars burn slow, ashes fall fast, and cocktails flow steady, it's the Stogie Geek Show! Partagas, since its introduction in 2014, Partagas 1845 Extra Fuerte has won critical acclaim and a devoted legion of fans. Flawless construction and full-bodied flavor are the hallmarks of this rich, dimensional cigar that features prevalent notes of wood and coffee. Made with a unique blend spanning three continents, Partagas 1845 Extra Fuerte is the perfect choice for any cigar smoking occasion. The founder of Defiant Whiskey, Tim Ferriss, built the distillery, the company, and the brand organically in the mountains of western North Carolina, in between deep sea commercial diving jobs. Tim will now explain a little bit about the spirit behind Defiant Whiskey. These guys are masters. They're, they're artisans. I wanted to learn how to do that. I wanted to learn how to make a spirit that people tasted and was like, oh my god, that's incredible. You taste that quality, you taste that drive, you taste that passion. The minute they take a sip, the conversation's over and they're just going, that's incredible. Saga Cigars, makers of the Saga Golden Age. The Golden Age is a cigar that takes you back to the classic days of cigar smoking. Through the six generations of experience by the Reyes family, the Saga Golden Age delivers a timeless blend that uses the nobility of the tobacco to bring you the perfect balance of power and flavor. It narrates better than words the history of a family's tradition in tobacco, delivering a cigar much like the ones they used to smoke in the times of Hemingway. Saga Golden Age is a full-bodied, full-flavored Dominican Puro. With tobaccos from one farm, the blend features a Corojo 2006 wrapper and filler from original Cuban seeds grown in the Dominican Republic. Available in four sizes at an affordable price, the Saga Golden Age is sure to please and take you back on a journey to yesteryear. Welcome, everybody, to the Stogie Geek Show. This is episode 157 for September 24th, 2015. I'm your host, Will Cooper, and I'm actually manning the controls tonight, but I'm not alone. Um, tonight, uh, I have a special guest co-host, uh, our good friend, Mr. Dave Burke from Cigar Jukebox, all the way in Australia. Dave, how you doing tonight? Uh, hi, good, Will. Thanks for having me on. It's actually... 10.50 in the morning here in Australia, so I'm having, having my morning cigar with uh, Stogie Geeks. It's great. Oh, man, it's so good to have you on. Uh, and we're going to be talking uh, with Dave in the, in the next couple of segments on uh, all the stuff going on with Cigar Jukebox. We're going to have a music segment with Dave. Uh, Dave's real knowledge, uh, really bringing the world of music and cigars together. So we'll be talking about that. Uh, before I introduce our special guest, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, I want to welcome a new sponsor to the Stogie Geeks, PDR Cigars. So welcome to PDR Cigars. They'll be uh, coming on board. You'll be hearing more about them. And then just a little uh, housekeeping. We are actually getting ready to move into our expanded studios right now up in the G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island. Uh, Paul's been working on that all week, and um, we may have something next week to really uh, show you. And I've seen some of the previews of this studio it's, it's going to knock your socks off is all I'm going to tell you. Um, but Dave, what are you, real quick, what are you smoking right now? Well, I'm smoking the uh, L'Atelier, the uh, ER-13. I'll hold it up there. Um, for some people, it's the red and gold label. So I'm smoking that. What are you smoking? Well, I actually picked a cigar um, that was just released um, from uh, our our special guest company, um, Asylum Cigars, and I'm smoking the new Ogre Lancero. 
Um, I am a huge fan of this ogre. This is the uh, Candela Barber Pole. Um, and this is the first time I've smoked the Lancero. And I've been actually a big fan of the ogre actually in the 70 ring gauge. This thing in the Lancero is, all I'm going to say is it is spectacular, um, is what I'm going to say. And normally I'm not a big, as big a Lancero guy as Paul, but this thing is smoking great. Um, I have the man behind Asylum, and I am real honored to have him on. I've been wanting to get him on the show for a while. Mr. Tom Wazuka. Tom, Will Cooper in North Carolina, and Dave Burke in Australia. How you doing tonight? Ah, doing great, Will. Doing great, Dave. Glad to be on. Well, thanks, thanks so much for uh, coming on here. And, and for folks to know, uh, yeah, I'm sucking up to my guests tonight. I'm wearing the uh, Michigan uh, sweatshirt. Uh, Tom is a proud Michigan fan. Um, and I'm a closet Michigan fan, I like to say. So um, very glad to have on. So, Tom, um, there's a lot I want to get into, and I'm just going to jump right into this. Um, one thing I've really admired about Asylum Cigars is, is how you built a line of great, great uh, brands under that line um, and just built that comp built that company which has been in three years I think it's been it's just really taken off and when I was going through the show there's a lot to cover um, before that Tom why don't you give us what what were you doing before you got to Asylum Cigars and how did you eventually uh, get into the cigar business uh, you know uh, many years ago I, I was in the restaurant business actually I owned uh, I was partners in a group of Jets Pizzas a chain that's going around the United States now. Uh, had some partners, and I was uh, running a bunch of stores. We had four stores that we had, and uh, I decided I had enough of that. And I was uh, sitting at home, uh, just you know, I like to hunt and fish, so I, I sold my shares of the company, and I went hunting and fishing for a while. And uh, my wife said, "It's about time you get a job <laughs> and go go back to work." And fortunately enough, I had some good friends in the industry. Uh, Michael Perales, uh, who, who has Impact Force here in Michigan, he sells a number of brands. He's an independent. And a good friend of mine, Mark Hayes, who's been with Fuente Newman for about 13 years now, I believe. Uh, and they said, you should, you should get in this business. And next thing you know, I went to work for Calibri uh, and was uh, selling lighters for them in Michigan. And I... Uh, through the couple of years I was with them, I got to meet a number of people in the business, and Christian was one of them. Uh, and he offered me a position with Camacho, and I went to work with Camacho in uh, around 2003, and then uh, spent uh, you know a number of years there. And uh, Christian sold the company to Davidoff. I stayed on board with, with Davidoff, and. Uh, uh, had a great experience uh, learning from those guys, and then uh, when the Christians non-compete ended, he asked me to come on board and uh, start a brand with them, and uh, Asylum is what we got. So, actually, it's a real good point I wanted to hit. So, I wanted to talk a little about the concept behind Asylum Cigars, and I'm going to give you what I think I've seen the concept from at least the third part of you, and you can tell me how far off I am. Yeah. You guys are what I look at is CLE's got this great portfolio. Um, they've got a lot of different brands in there. Asylum's the brand that I think goes against the grain and does everything different. What, was that the vision you had with Asylum Cigars? Well, you know, the real vision of Asylum was is kind of funny. You know, it, it was very off the hook. Uh, me and Christian put it together in, in a, a timely fashion. You know, it was... Uh, we, we would get together to meet. We're working on the CLE products, and, you know, we come up with the Asylum brand, and the next thing you know, we're like, screw it, let's go to Nicaragua and make them. So next thing you know, we're in Nicaragua working with the factory there, and, uh, you know, the one thing that I wanted from the beginning was the big ring gauge cigars. And, uh, you know, Christian was like, no chance, kid, we're not doing that. <laughs> and I said, well, I already ordered the bands. You need to order the molds. And uh, so he said, all right, uh, I'm going to hate to say I told you so, but we're going to do it. And uh, obviously the asylum uh, we, we were kind of blew up because of the 70 ring gauge stuff. And, uh, and we haven't looked back. So, you know, the 70 has been the leader in, in our stable from, uh, from day one. It still is to this day. And, uh, you know, I think just between quality and value, uh, it, it's just hard to beat. So I think it's a real go-to cigar for a lot of people around the country. And, uh, you know, we're getting, uh, you know, we just came back from Inner Tobacco in Germany. And, 
you know, we got great response in uh, a number of countries there that we're distributing in now. So it's uh, it's definitely the big ring gauge craze is not just in the U.S. I, that's, I was just going to ask that. So so Europe have they have they been in? I mean, when did they start embracing? Is it recent, more recently, or have they kind of always been on board with that? No, I think very recently because they really haven't anything haven't had anything in their marketplace of that size. Uh, you know, we opened uh, in, in France, in Holland, uh, in, two years ago in Holland, and uh, it had great response. And then, uh, again, we, we keep adding more countries and more countries. And, you know, I think there's there's really only one or two big ring gauge cigars there. I, I, I think Ernie Carrillo is over there. And then uh, I, I think, uh, who is it, uh, Alec Bradley has the Texas Lanceros I see over there too. So... Uh, but there's just not a lot of big ring gauges. And, and I was really surprised, taken back by the response of the 80 ring gauge cigars. Uh, all the stores are selling the 80 ring gauge there. I mean, even bigger than the 70, the response on the 80s was really, really good. As, as it was here as well. And one thing that I've admired, you know, there are, there are the critics of the big ring gauge cigars, and I'm sure you've heard that. But one thing that I've always liked about it is it brings choice to the consumer. And in my opinion, if it, if it brings someone in as a cigar enthusiast and it gives them a choice, I think it's a great thing. I, I mean, maybe it's not what I'm going to smoke. And I've enjoyed that 80, by the way. Oh, um, yeah, it may not be something I smoke every day, but I think it does bring that choice there, which is something you've, you've offered to the consumers there. Well, and I think we offer it at a great price, too. So yeah. it's... Uh, there's value to it, and again, the the cigars smoke great. You know, they burn cool, so they they last a long time, and uh, uh, it just has a really good value, good flavor, and it's obviously uh, found its niche in the U.S. market for sure. So when you came out with the eighty, you originally went with a six by eighty, um, and then now this year you've just introduced the eight by eighty. From what I heard, it, and I don't know if I heard this incorrect, there were some challenges originally with taking that cigar from a 6 to an 8. Is that true? Yeah, just you need really big wrappers, you know. And uh, uh, depending on the, bland, the brand, uh, you know, obviously we make it in the uh, authentic Corojo that we grow out of Honduras. And those are very small leaves, so uh, we have to really pick through and find the right wrappers to be able to do that cigar. Uh, the Habano wrapper we use out of Nicaragua on the 13 Nicaragua, uh, they're pretty big leaf, so we were able to get that, but we just kind of held off and uh, we just kind of segmented it, you know. I mean, part of the reason was that, but we also wanted to soft launch the 80 uh, with the 80 by 6 to see, see the response, a- and then we obviously followed up with the 80 by 8. And, and is it true that the 80 was originally made because it was a customer who asked for it? Yeah, well, you know, it's kind of funny because, uh, you know, the 70s, we launched the 70s and uh, the tinderbox in Waldorf, Maryland just went crazy with them. I mean, they were selling them like crazy. And we were, my, myself and Christian were in there doing a visit one day and a number of the customers said, listen, you make the 80, we'll buy it. So me and Christian sat back and said, hey, should we make the 80? And said, well, what do we got to lose? It, it, it makes the 70 look kind of normal at some point, you know? That's, that's a good point. Now, has anyone come to you saying, hey, how about a 9 by 90 Uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 100 by 10 uh, I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if we'll go any bigger. I, I mean, right now we don't have any plans in the future to, to, to go bigger. You know, we want the cigars to be smoked. I, I don't want them to be novelty, you know? Uh, so as long as people smoke them, if there becomes a time where there's a demand, I'm, I'm sure we'll go bigger. Uh, kind, kind of like the big house, we're not going to let anyone make bigger cigars than us. You know, so Michigan's got the biggest football stadium, and if anyone goes bigger, they'll keep expanding. So we're, we, we want to be the big ring gauge people. So if, if we get tested, I guess we'll make bigger ones. <laughs> exactly. Now, now, Dave, you had a pretty good question uh, in the in the prep we were talking about about the seventy ring gauges. Yeah. Um, hi, Tom. Um, my question is, when you're making those larger ring gauge cigars, because there's so much tobacco involved, is it a challenge to keep 
that blend consistent? Is it is it hard, say, to keep a blend consistent that's in like a robusto, and then amp that up to a seven by seventy with all the all the tobacco? Is it hard to keep that blend uh, and the balance in the finish the same? No, I, you know, I think we've been very fortunate. We have, uh, you know, between Honduras and Nicaragua, we have very veteran people with 40 plus years in the business. My partner Christian's been in it for 20. His father's been in it his entire life uh, from Cuba to the U.S. and over to Honduras in 1962. So uh, we've got great people. And, and you know, I, I think we've been able to keep a very consistent product flavor wise. Uh, I think keeping the blend the same has not been an issue for us a, a, at all. Uh, you know, the hardest part is burn. You know, the, 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 the big cigars, they're, they're big, thick wrappers, and, um, you know, the, the burn is, is keeping a consistent burn is, is, is a real challenge with the big ring gauges. Is that, is that uh, go for draw as well, trying to keep the draw even and, and not – either not too loose or not too tight is that also like a construction issue uh you know what i don't believe it hasn't been for us i mean they burn very consistently uh, you know draw uh, from camacho times to cle in, in asylum uh draw has never been an issue with our product we draw test every cigar as they come off the lines and uh so uh no i, I it, draw has never been an issue for us So, Tom, in terms of Asylum 13 has probably been the brand that, I mean, really put you guys on the map. Um, one thing that I was amazed about, and you have a lot of other brands that I want to get into under, under Asylum or other lines. Yeah. But so two years ago, though, Asylum got its first uh, top 25 rating in uh, Cigar Aficionado. And it was it turned out it was... Under your premium line, it was the 4x44 Petit Corona. Was, yeah. yeah. So was that a surprise? I mean, because I, I know that was a, a size, you know, that probably a lot of us weren't talking about because we were so engulfed in the, in the big ring gauges. Yeah. You know, listen, it was a great honor for Cigar Aficionado to put us in the top 25. And, uh, you know, yeah, we were surprised. I mean, uh, we didn't know it was coming. You know, they gave it a 94 rating and. uh we we obviously we're very happy with it. The size continues to do well, uh, and it's a great blend. I mean, the cigar is very good, you know, and, and it's hard to beat for under five bucks. Oh, I I agree. I mean, I agree. It's a, it's just a wonderful uh, petite Corona there. Um, now, what I've seen is, and I kind of before the show was just going through all the cigars that you've come out with in the last three years, and you Asylum's built. I mean, it's, it's hit the market running. And you have a huge amount of brands and facings under the Asylum uh, label. Um, basically, how have, you, how have you managed that? Because in, in a time right now where you hear of everyone fighting for shelf space and, you know, it, it's tough. But you guys have about a dozen brands out there under Asylum right now. How have you been able to be successful at that? Well, you know, I think uh, obviously the success of the 13 helps. You know, when uh, you have a product that you put in and, and, and it turns instantly and it's a constant turn for, for the retailer and the consumer. Uh, when we came out with something new, it was uh, an easy placement for these guys to give us a little bit of space to try uh, the Insidious or the Corojo or one of our other products uh, or the Schizo and the Schizo Maduro. Um, so the placements, and they all fit their, their own unique segment. You know, I don't try and come out with anything that competes with something I'm already doing. So, you know, we're trying to fit each niche market and find something that fits, uh, has its place in everybody's humidor. And again, I think price points make it an everyday cigar. Pretty much everything we do other than a couple of lines in, in Asylum uh, are, you know, under $8. Uh, you know, everything is at 4 to $8 price point. So, uh you know, I think people are willing to try the products because the, they've tried the 13s and the ogres uh, and they've enjoyed them. So they're, uh, for them to come in and try in one of our new products because of the successes of the others have made it easier for us to get those placements. Oh, yeah. And you, you speak of the ogre. And I'm smoking the, the ogre Lancero right now. And if 
Paul's listening, he's going to be real jealous. Uh, this is just a, it's got, it's got creamy, it's got sweetness. It is a real, I, I was real surprised how this is, this is smoking in the Lancero here. Um, and what's, and why I'm surprised about that, Tom, and it kind of goes back to what Dave's point was, it always seemed like the ogre to me, because that 70 was the first size of the ogre, it always seemed like that, that was always my favorite size still of the line. Um, and this Lancero, though, is just, I mean, you guys who are not smoking this are jealous. Has, has this Lancero hit the market yet? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, we, had it, we had it ready to go at the show. I mean, okay. started, That's where I got this one, yeah. Yeah, they started shipping before we left the trade show. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, this is a... Now, did you, in terms of, you've been very successful with a barber pole, a Candela, I should say. Yeah. You know, a lot of times Candela has been a seasonal cigar. For the most part, what we've seen with most companies, there are some exceptions. But you've taken this to a regular production lineup. Folks enjoy all year round. It's one of your better selling cigars, from what I understand. It's our number two in the line to the regular thirteen Nicaragua. So, wow. uh, uh, you know, it's uh, the ogre does a, a great job for us, and I, I think it just has a unique flavor. I mean, you know, I, every day we try and come up with something new and, and be original and not. You know, try not to do something that anybody else has done. And, you know, as long as I've been in the business, uh, you know, in smoking cigars the last 20 years, uh, I've never seen anyone do a Barber Pole Candela. So, you know, I originally made that cigar as a, uh, for a friend of mine. He, he was a coach, football coach at Eastern Michigan University, a gentleman named Ron English, who's a good friend. And he was at University of Michigan for a while. And I met Ron there and, uh, I would always do his, their charity things for the University of Michigan. When Ron got the job at Eastern, he uh, approached me and uh, my sales rep, uh, Nook, to uh, come out and support the event. And so we did that. I always made him uh, a Liberty. When we were still with Camacho, I would do a Candela Liberty because Eastern Michigan's colors are green. So I did a Candela Liberty for him in the coffin boxes. And uh, when I left Davidoff and Camacho, Ron had asked me, uh, our relationship was strong. He said, Tom, I want to do one with you. Can you make me something? So the original Ogre was really just 10 boxes to give away at his charity event for Eastern Michigan's football program to raise some money. And uh, Christian said, hey, why, why don't we make this a, uh, uh, put it into our everyday production? And, you know, two years you know, two years later, it's one of our top selling cigars. So it's been a great success for us. And now, though, it's expanded to five sizes, right? With the Lancero? Yeah, we, you know, we've got the uh, Lancero 50 by 5, 60 by 6, 70 by 7, 80 by 8. And we also launched the uh, Super 11 18s. That's right, to six. Yeah. And is the Lancero, is it like the 99 Problems? Is it a limited run or is it something that's. Uh, going to be ongoing? Well, you know, I don't do anything that's limited per se. So I don't put a number and say I'm only making, you know, 25,000 of these. The initial production of that cigar is 25,000 cigars. Uh, we sold out most of it at the trade show. We have a few left. Uh, but obviously next year we'll, we'll do another production run of those if the consumer wants them, you know. So... Uh, 99 Problems was originally a 50,000 cigar run, so we have uh, a, a few of those left, but not too many. Uh, but we can make them. You know, we don't do anything that's, uh, you know, nothing says limited edition or limitada or anything like that on our, uh, you know, on Asylum. Everything, it, it, Dragon's Milk is a thousand boxes a quarter that I do with that, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. But uh, for the most part, we really don't do limited editions. We do short productions, and then next year, we'll do another production. Got it. Got it. Yeah, and I, is, this, is this the uh, Asylum Ogre Lancero? Is this sold in the 99-count boxes? No, they're 30-count uh, boxes. So okay. I, 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 I didn't want to get stabbed by retailers when I walked in and offered <laughs> them another 99-count box. <laughs> I, I thought I'd be a little nicer this time. <laughs> what, what was the ration? I mean, 30-count boxes are... What was the rationale? Because you have a lot of those 30 count boxes in, in the portfolio. What was the rationale with those? Uh, you know, they're just very big. You know, the brick and mortar shops uh, tend to be 
uh, one to show, one to go, you know. So it, it just, you know, the, the 50s and the 60s come in 50-count boxes. Uh, so it's basically we're selling them the one to show to one to go in one single package. Got it. Got it. Yeah, so there's a, a bunch of the other brands I wanted to talk about. It was uh, another brand that I've kind of enjoyed, um, and I'm actually I'm going to smoke it probably as my next cigar. I am going to smoke it my next cigar. Is the Asylum Straight Jacket? Can you tell us a little about that cigar? Yeah, the Straight Jacket is uh, again a Nicaraguan puro. We do out of Nicaragua. It's a uh, medium to full body, very spicy cigar. Yep. Um, you know, it's a higher price point for Asylum. So I think, you know, uh, we have a lot of fans of that cigar. It's not our fastest selling cigar, but it's it, it to me it's one of the best cigars we make. I mean, it, it's all four year age tobacco. It's still smooth, but has lots of body to it. Uh, but you know, again, price point dictates it. That one's you know a little higher in price point that nine to twelve dollar retail. So it's a little bit higher depending on the tax where you're at. So uh, I, I think it kind of runs into a lot of competition at that price point. But uh, the, me personally, I think it's one of the best cigars we've ever made. I mean, it, it, yeah. it's, it's a great cigar. Yeah, it's got, I mean, the spice, it is a spicier cigar, but it's got a lot of nuances with that spice when, when I smoke it, um, is what I get from that. It, it's, like I said, and you've, uh, how many sizes come in that cigar? Uh, we do four sizes. Okay. You don't do an 80 in this, uh, in this one, right? We don't. 70. 70 is the biggest in that one. Okay. So another another line that you have, and it kind of gets, I think it's one of your older lines, and you've just expanded it with a Maduro, is the Schizo. Can you talk a yeah. little about that cigar? Yeah, Schizo, you know, that's uh, our uh, mixed filler bundle out of Nicaragua, the the original one. Uh, amazing. I mean, we can't, uh, uh, we're growing three to 400% a year, year over year with that cigar. And uh, it's just, it's a great price point. You know the robusto starts at like a dollar eighty or dollar eighty six now. I think we had a three cent price increase this year. So, <laughs> you know a monster, uh, but we tr- you know I try and limit our price increases and keep them to to a manageable level. But uh, you know it's just a great everyday cigar. You know if you're a guy who smokes ten cigars a day and you're looking for something that's a, it's really I think a medium body cigar. Uh, they burn great. You know. Uh, the the cigar itself has nice flavor and uh, the price is hard to beat. And then you also introduced a Maduro counterpart this year with it. Yeah, I, I mean the Maduro is amazing. Uh, it, it really is. It's a San Andreas Maduro that we grow in Honduras. Christian's father uh, grows the San Andreas seed in in Honduras now, and uh, so this is one of the first products we release with that. And, uh, again, it's been gangbusters for us because price point's amazing. A- and, you know, we did a lot of testing with that cigar where, you know, unbanded when we first came out with it, giving it to customers and letting them try it. And, we, you know, we'd always ask them, hey, what would you pay for that cigar? And it was constantly 7 to $9, <laughs> you know. And I'm like, that's it's going to be 2 to $4. Wow. You know? and, and, and you're growing, so you're, you're taking the San Andreas seed and you're growing that in Honduras right now. Correct, yeah. And so is that something we can expect to see maybe more with and then across some of the other CLE portfolios? I think so, yeah. In the future, I would imagine, uh, you know, we just launched the Everyday Hustle, which is an all Honduran cigar under the uh, One Shot, One Kill, Edgar Hoyles brand. And uh, so we'll, we'll probably add to that portfolio. It's a great price point, five to seven bucks, all traditional sizes instead of, you know, Edgar's lines have tended to come in a lot of different shapes, double perfectos and shaggy foot and trompetas. So this is a uh, uh, more of a traditional line, traditional sizes uh, at a great price point. So uh, we'll probably be, you know, looking to add uh, a Maduro and a Connecticut to that portfolio sometime in the future uh, 2017 2018 oh that'll be awesome that'll be awesome. yeah he's got some real i mean i look at the uh edgar's lines and he's got those rt i mean it's the artesian not just in the in the vitolas but in that artwork as well which is it's just great great to uh, very artesian look and i like that a lot yeah very you know his edgar's stuff is very visual you know yes. it's something that catches your attention it's a very specific uh L.A. style, you know, that's uh, Edgar is, uh, 
you know, grew up in Guadalajara and then uh, in Houston. He grew up as a child and, uh, you know, and then moved obviously to the uh, Orange County, uh, Orange, California, L.A. area and did a lot of art and, you know, worked for magazines, I believe Heavy Hitters and Lowrider Magazine. He was doing a lot of the photography work for them. So, you know, he's a pretty creative guy and I, I think it comes out in his products. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, last year uh, at the trade show, you, uh, Asylum, again, went in a little bit of a direction I didn't expect it. Uh, you launched a, a cigar, a Connecticut shade cigar called Insidious, um, yes, which is a sweet tip cigar. And now you've expanded that to um, a Maduro. And then this year you introduced a Habano. Uh, that's another cigar. Great price point. And um, why don't you talk a little about what, what's behind that line? Well, you know, that line itself is obviously, you know, the, we're always trying to attract that new 25-year-old smoker, somebody who's new, new to the industry, someone's walking in the store uh, saying, hey, you know, I'm just starting to smoke, uh, you know, I like something mild, and, you know, obviously the sweet cap, we were known for making one of those before with another company we had, uh, but, you know, we're really not looking to compete against that product. That's an established customer who's been around for many years, who smokes that product. You know, we're looking for the new customer, a, a younger kind of hipper crowd with obviously the Asylum Skulls and, and, and our own take on uh, uh, our design. And so it's just a, a nice beginner cigar. Again, it's really meant for the beginning smoker. It's got that light, sweet cap. They get a real instant gratification to their lips when they smoke it because we use the molasses pectin instead of the vegetable base. And so it's uh, a great cigar. Smooth, that little sweetness wears off about an inch through the cigar. Uh, and, and so women, uh, young smokers, old smokers who just want something mild at a great price point, it, fit, it fits a big niche, and it, it's been a big success for us too. And that's obviously why we launched the Maduro. I think the Maduro is amazing, you know, for, for, for under five bucks, you can get a 64 by seven. Uh, it's got just great flavor again, very, very smooth, that rich flavor from the Maduro and that little sweetness, uh, you know, it's perfect with a cup of coffee in the morning. So it's, uh, just a great cigar. Yeah. And my, you talk about the younger smokers. I have a son who's 19 and he occasionally will have a cigar and he's had a little bit of difficulty, I think getting into Maduro's, uh, and sometimes there's some harshness at the beginning. And I found with that and giving him that insidious Maduro, it definitely mitigates that and gets him into that cigar where, and now that it's a cigar, to be honest with you, you said it's beginner. I enjoy those cigars too. Um, they're like you said, with a cup of coffee, uh, they're great cigars. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I mean, like you said, it, obviously we're, our target is uh, a beginning smoker. It's a, it's an easy lead in for a retailer. Uh, to put it on their shelves, and when somebody comes in looking, like for weddings or anything like that, golf outings, you can throw them around a little bit. You don't have 15 bucks invested in it. Uh, you know, you got four or five bucks invested in it, so it's great for the golf course, you know, great for mowing the lawn. Uh, you know, and like I said, uh, if, if, if your lady likes to smoke with you, it's a nice mild cigar for her to try too. Yeah, and like I said, you have three options with the Connecticut Shade, the Maduro, and not the Habano. So, I mean, there's, like I said, there's a lot of choice there as well as different sizes, too. Yeah, you know, it's kind of meant to be its own brand. You know, yeah. uh, it's under Asylum, but, the, you know, the Insidious is kind of taking its own course with the three sizes, and it has its own little following now, and uh, it keeps growing, doing very well. So, and with the exception of the 64, you've kept those more traditional sizes for, I guess, again, with the beginner smoker in mind. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, this is the one I've been wanting to get to. Um, this, this cigar, it's one of my favorites. It's become, um, and I didn't expect it to become one of my favorites, but I've never talked to you about this. And that's the Dragon's, that's the Asylum Dragon's Milk. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, we're hearing a lot about Obviously, barrel aging and is a big trend right now in the industry. Um, but late last year, you you introduced this Dragon's Milk cigar, um, which I it not only I did I enjoy that cigar, it led me to actually start drinking the Dragon's Milk beer, which I had not drank before. Yeah. Um, 
this is this is a real. I mean, there's a lot of barrel aged project projects out there, but this one is unique. Can you talk a little? You could probably talk better, obviously, than I can. Talk about that because it is a very unique what you're doing with this. Well, it, it, and listen, it's a short run product. Um, you know, we are uh, finishing up the last run, and it's going to go away soon. Uh, so. Oh uh, no! Really? Yeah. Well, Just we, my heart. <laughs> no, well, listen. We we had a little trademark issue, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it, it, instead of fighting the trademarks, well, you know, we still have the barrels, we still have the cigars. We're going to relaunch it. Uh, it's not going to be called Dragon's Milk. Uh, I'm going to work with New Holland Brewery uh, coming up in October. I got to go visit them, and we've got a couple ideas, and and we'll launch the cigar. We're probably going to put it in new packaging instead of the milk carton. It's going to go into a box now uh, and maybe add a few more sizes to it. But uh, the, the cigar is going to be the same. It'll be the same blend, same, uh, same process that we do it. And I think one of the things that, that makes it unique it, it, it is the process that we do uh, for making the cigar. And most of the guys I see, uh, you know, you know, obviously, I read about all these other barrel infused and barrel aged cigars out there. Most of them are just doing the filler. They're packing the filler in barrels. They're rotating it every day. Uh, our approach was a little different. I spent about a year and a half working with Brent Vandekamp, uh, the owner, one of the owners of New Holland, on the project. And so we tried a bunch of different blends. But really, what we do different is we cut the barrels. We add a racking system inside the barrel, and then I place the entire cigar in the barrel. So it's not just the filler or just the wrapper leaf. The entire cigar gets aged inside the barrel. Uh, we close it up, we let them sit, and uh, then we pull them out, we dry them, and they're ready to go. So uh, it's, a, it's a completely different process. It takes a lot less time. Uh, where we age them, you know, uh, the cigars within two days are completely saturated, binder, wrapper, and filler. Uh, they literally start drip, they're dripping wet within five minutes of being in that barrel closed off. So what I found is after two, you know, they're in there for less than 72 hours. Uh, they age in the barrel and they can't absorb any more moisture from the barrel after that. So we pull them out, we put some more in. Each barrel we can use about 30 days. Uh, before all the moisture dries up out of the barrel. And uh, then I send new barrels down to Nicaragua. So uh, it's a completely different process than what everyone else does. I think, you know, for us, what we were trying to do is make a cigar first and then second have the bourbon taste, the, the, the beer, you know, the, their subtle hints of each instead of it being very dramatic. You know, it's... Uh, very subtle. You definitely get the charred oak. Aromatically, you, you definitely smell the beer and the, uh, the spirit that, that it was aged in. And obviously in the taste, I think it's still a cigar first. And all the other, other subtle hints come with the cigar. Absolutely. And that, that was like, um, I, I don't like to call it an infused cigar. I, I thought it was more of an influence cigar. And, and yeah. because there's a lot of, it, this smokes like a cigar as opposed to something that's a flavored cigar. The, the barrels, though, are unique because, I mean, from how they make the, this is how, ended, how they make the beer. The beer is aged in a barrel that was used previously for bourbon, correct? Correct. So what they do is they get first oak, you know, first use oak barrels. Uh, they start their bourbon in that barrel. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how long they keep the bourbon in that barrel, but once they pull the bourbon out, they put the beer in it, they age the beer, then they pull the beer out, and they put the bourbon back in it. So they have what they call beer barrel bourbon. Uh, so it's got a little bit of the beer in the same kind of idea that we have, and then we just add another step to it with the tobacco. So, it, you know, it's, uh, it's had the beer, it's had the bourbon twice in the barrel, and so it gives you a little bit of everything. And, and it's available in one size, a double Corona? Correct. What was Correct. the uh, rationale for that size? Uh, you know what? I didn't want it to be too small. Uh, I'm not quite sure why we actually picked that size 100%. I think we wanted to make something 
uh, that was at least, you know, uh, uh, a, a 52 ring gauge or a 54, uh, you know, uh, but we just didn't want it to be too small. And, and I think now that we've came out with it, you know, we'll look at some new smaller sizes to go with it when, when we do the new production under a new, under a new name. Right, right. Yeah, like I said, there's and double Corona is one of those sizes that I find um, it's it does there's a lot of misses in the market. It just it it clicked with that cigar, um, in that double Corona size. No, thank you. I mean, we tried uh, a number of sizes and obviously different blends, and you know that was the one that uh, definitely stood out to me, and that's why we went with it. Yep. No, great cigar. Uh, I got a couple more lines, and then we'll, we'll hit some other questions here. Um. So another one you came out with this year, uh, Asylum uh, launched its first cigar for the Tobacconist Association of America. It's uh, Nictophilia. Tell yeah. us about that cigar. Well, you know, that was a cigar. Actually, we, we, we were originally going to launch nationally, and then uh, we just held it back. We, you know, we had enough out in the marketplace. We wanted to let everything get going. And then when uh, TAA approached us about doing uh, a special blend for them, we uh, you know, we had a couple of different versions we sent over to them. We let them pick the, the final blend. And, uh, you know, we picked the three sizes of 50 by 5, 60 by 6, and 70 by 7. And, uh, you know, it's a, 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 a Maduro, you know, it's a, a nice dark Maduro wrapper, uh, lots of rich flavor, and uh, it's been a good success. I think the TAA members are doing very well with the cigar, and uh, we're going to continue to make that as a TAA exclusive in the future, I hope, and, uh, uh, and, and keep it going. So it's not a one-and-done TAA like a lot of them are. It's going to be ongoing for those retailers that are members. Yeah, we did. You know, what we did is uh, obviously they, they're one-year kind of deals with them, and uh, we've left it up to them. If they want us to continue, uh, we'll continue it. So uh, I think the talks so far have been uh, – you know, one of the selling points of it was they can continue to buy it. So uh, I, I think they, they, they were very welcome to the idea of having a cigar that they can continually buy, it not just be a one and done. And uh, so I, I think it's been a great success. And, you know, they didn't have to order huge quantities up front because they're not going to be able to get it again. So they could buy what they need. And as they sell through it, they can reorder. So I, I think it's been uh, very good for both of us. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that one too. I uh, it's a good price point as well with that one for a TAA cigar. Yeah, you know, I think we're just uh, about a dollar more than the regular thirteen line. I think we're at six, seven, and eight dollar retail. Yeah, yeah, very, very reasonable for a really good Maduro. And then I just the last one I'll hit um, is another one you launched at the trade show. I love this cigar. Um, I smoked it in the uh, the Corona Gorda, uh, and it's your Asylum Thirty Three. Can you talk yes. about that one? Yeah, so that's a, a new project. Uh, that's what I'm uh, smoking now here is uh, the 33 myself and uh, in the 46 by five and a half. But uh, this is a project that is uh, going to be kind of an ongoing, ever-changing project. And the first blend that we did is the Asylum 33. It's all seven-year age tobacco out of Honduras. Uh, it's a special blend that Christian's father actually helped us with, with some, uh, uh, tobacco that he had. And, uh, you know, we obviously use some Corojo in it also, but we don't actually tell the whole blend on this cigar, but this, this is a cigar that we, we make in small batches. I think the initial production was 600 boxes of each size. Uh, it's something we'll continue to do in, in, in small batch, just because if the demands there, we'll make it. Uh, but we're already looking at new projects under the 33, 33 brand. It's a higher price point, like 9 to $13 um, for Asylum. It's a higher price point. But it's uh, uh, really a, a great blend, very smooth, earthy cigar, lots of spice through your nose. Uh, and, and the idea is really to walk people through uh, the journey of making a cigar. So the, the, the next one that we do, uh, myself and Christian will be traveling the world looking for some aged tobaccos. The whole idea is to use aged tobaccos with this product, uh, with the 33. So it could be Dominican the next one. It could be, uh, you know, Indonesian tobacco. Who knows what we're going to use? You know, we're, we're going to go around the world and uh, 
but we're going to video the process. So when we go and if I can find 15 year age tobacco, uh, we'll have the our camera crew there showing us the tobacco. We'll be there picking it and, and sorting it and going through it. Uh, and, and then in the end, we'll put a complete video for social media for the stores to have on DVD. And it'll be the entire journey of how each one of these blends come together. Oh, I love that. That is a stogie geek that, that very, very uh, much appeals to me. You know, I was looking at the band of that, and it's a very, very interesting band design. On there, you have, um, I believe it's called the Eye of Providence. What, what went into that band design? Because it was really a cool band. You know, it was just an idea. Obviously, the, the 33 Project, the, the, the name actually came, Christian came up with the 33 Project. Um, obviously, uh, there's a number of people around the country who understand what 33 is. Me, personally, I'm, I'm not a Mason, uh, but... Uh, it's Christian, the highest degree. It's the highest degree, right? Yes, I believe Christian's grandfather in Cuba was a 33, so it's kind of a tribute to Christian's grandfather. Uh, but it's not just a Mason cigar. 33 is, is obviously a, a very worldly number. Uh, the idea is to uh, make people think about the numbers, just like the 13. People always ask what the 13 is. We don't really talk about it. We just say it's just a number. Uh, but uh, the, the brand itself, the Eye of Providence, obviously goes into uh, – that whole mentality, that way of thinking, um, you know, uh, Christian himself is, a, we're both very patriotic guys. We love the country we live in and, and uh, we love the heritage and the, in the history of our com- country. So it has a lot to do with it. It's not a Mason cigar. It, it, it's really about uh, the country and, and 33 in general. Great. So, Dave, I've been monopolizing it here. I know you have a couple of questions to ask Tom. Uh, why don't I turn it over to you? Well, first off, I can hear you guys talk cigars all day. It's just fantastic hearing it. And I gotta, I'm gotta i going to the States soon, so I'll have to hunt down that Ogre Lancero because I've seen pictures of it, and it looks incredible. Dave, you gotta smoke. you got to smoke this thing. Uh, it looks telling. amazing. Like, it the, is that, really that good. Oh. Yeah, yeah. But... And I've been listening, and you've been talking a lot, Tom, about the cigars and about you know a lot of the success that Asylum has had, both with the the cigars and and things. Um, I was wondering in in the partnership with Christian, like, what are some what are some characteristics or reasons that you think that partnership has worked so well? Well, you know, for 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 myself, obviously, I got to spend a lot of time with Christian. Uh, Working with him at Camacho, um, you know, he gave me my first shot on the cigar side of the business, and uh, I was very fortunate. You know, we're the same age. Uh, I'm actually a little bit older than him. I think he looks way older than I do. But and he uh, calls you kid, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm older than he is. So yeah, he calls me kid. And I'm older <laughs> than him too. I know that. <laughs> but uh, I think that's an endearing term for a Christian. You know, yeah, he calls you kid. But uh, you know, I was very fortunate. You know. Uh, everybody you talk about time and place and timing in life is everything and you know when I started with Camacho uh, obviously they had been out for about three years and had a, a, a nice success very good success with launching that company and they already had the back rat and the national brand lines uh, that they were doing well with and uh, but Christian and the whole crew there they, they took me in very quickly and uh, Christian had always asked you know, from day one, he's like, hey, I'm going to Honduras. You want to come help me work on some blends? And I would take him up on it. And, and so I got to get down to Honduras quite a bit and really see all the processes from the growing to the fermentation and really kind of, you know, just kind of drown myself in everything that was happening. And uh, over the years, I started doing a lot of the tours, taking customers from all over the country down and introducing them to the products and introducing them to, you know, Christian's father and, and the heritage and the tradition that, uh, that his father has and their family name has. So it, uh, it, it was just a, a, a friendship that started really well. Christian's children, my children are all around the same age. He, he has three boys. I have two boys, and they're all the same age. And uh, so we'd bring them down to BD, 
you know, we'd let him beat each other up. His kids would need a gringo. He'd tell me, bring your kids down. We need, they need a gringo fix. They haven't seen any white people in a while. So <laughs> I, I, I'd, bring, I, I'd bring my kids to Miami so they could <laughs> see some gringo kids, you know. <laughs> but it's just been a great friendship. I mean, myself and Christian, uh, you know, obviously we, 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 we think a lot, of, a lot alike. And then we think very differently, which I think makes it work. Our, our backgrounds are very different. And, uh, you know, one of the best things is, you know, we come up with great ideas when we're together. You know, we, uh, when we, we don't get a chance. I'm on the road 300 days, and Christian's doing the manufacturing side and ma- making sure the office is well, and he's doing traveling. So we don't get a lot of time to travel together anymore. But our, our really our best ideas come together when, when, we, when we work together. And we get to spend some time together, and uh, uh, and, and it's just you know it's been a great friendship. You know, we, we have a business relationship, uh, but we laugh every day. I, I think uh, you know the whole experience has been you know I, I feel very privileged to have the opportunity uh, to have a brand and, and to work with Christian and his father and uh, Sandra, our lady in Honduras, who takes care of everything, and Luis and. Uh, you know, all, all the people that are a part of this, all the girls in the office, it, it's a huge team effort, and, it, and it's great to be a part of it and continue to grow. And, you know, when me and Christian first got together, we put our contract together. Uh, we were laughing because we, 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 we talked about, well, what do we do if we have a dispute that we cannot resolve, you know? And so we sat there, we looked at each other, and I just said, listen, I, I'm not – you know, yeah, it's great to make money, but I, I'm not here. Uh, uh, it's not about making money every day for me. Uh, it's really about a good product, and, and I'm privileged to be in an industry that we get to do what we do. Uh, so, uh, you know, I cherish it every day. And so we, we sat back and we said, well, let's, let's do this. Best of three, rock, paper, scissors, winner take all. And uh, so if we ever have a dispute that we can't resolve, it's in our contract. We have to do Rock, paper, scissors, best of three. Winner, win, win, winner wins and the loser licks his wounds. And uh, if we ever get there again, better luck next time in rock, paper, scissors. So we, we've kept it pretty simple. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah, you know, we've kept it pretty simple. And, and, and I think that's one of the keys to everything is, uh, you know, we, we really do work well together and, and we enjoy the time we have and enjoy the business that we're in. And I think that makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, I mean, and I'll, I just have one more question. I think it's great to hear you say that because I think as consumers, I mean, I can just speak for myself. You walk in the shop and you see the cigar and sometimes you think like it's the cigar just exists in a vacuum and, you, and it's good to hear about the people behind it and how it came together and and all of that. And, and I guess for me as well, for you when with the cigar, what what are some what's like the, some challenges you've had to overcome with a cigar and, and what cigar in, in the asylum portfolio are you most proud of? Uh, you know, I, I think that the, the biggest challenge I have to overcome is my lack of Spanish. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, you know, I've been working in the industry for, uh, you know, going on 15 years and 14 years and my Spanish is still horrible. So, my office, all the girls in my office make fun of me and get mad at me because they tell me we've been working together for, for 13 years and I haven't even tried. And uh, <laughs> my, my, my answer to that is, uh, well, listen, I, I'm not even very good at English, so let, let, me, let me work on <laughs> I'll see what I can do about Spanish in the future. But, uh, no, you know, uh, I've been very fortunate, again, in the sense that I've got great people with, uh, I mean, knowledge that I can only hope to gain someday between Christian and his father and, and, and you know, Luis and Sandra and all the people we have in, in Honduras and Nicaragua that have been with us for 40, 40 plus years. So, um, you know, if there's an issue, there's always somebody that can help me get, get around it, whether it's with the blending or, or any of that. Um, you know, there hasn't been any real stumbling blocks for us, you know. I mean, trying to put certain tobaccos together and, and obviously the big ring gauges, you know, those guys are the experts. I mean, I don't go, you know, I, 
I can roll a cigar if I have to, but they're not that pretty. Uh, but you know, to, 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 to really go in, uh, you know, the experts are down there, you know, Christian, his father. And again, I, I, I've been able to learn a lot over the years and I still learn every day, but, uh, you know, the, the thing I'm most proud of is obviously the Asylum 13. I mean, it, it just, uh, I think we changed the industry a bit with that cigar. I mean, we weren't the first people to come out with a 70. There was a couple people, George Rico from Gran Habano, uh, JFR had one out too. Uh, but it didn't explode until we came onto the scene. You know, we put it out there uh, and whatever we did, you know, I, I don't have the recipe for it, but it, it really just made a huge impact and changed uh, the industry in a sense because everybody has come out with a 70 now. You know, there's very few companies that don't have one. And, uh, you know, so that's what I'm most proud of. You know, we were able to come in at a price point and really uh, make the market kind of come to us with this one, you know. Oh, no, it's great. great. It sounds like from Will that not just the 70s, but the Lancero is uh... – something to be proud of as well. I'm going to have to check that out. No, thank you very much. I think uh, both of them, the 99 Problems and the Ogre, uh, you know, the Ogre is such a unique cigar. You know, it has, uh, you know, my understanding is there's a couple people kind of going to knock it off and do Barber Pole Lanceros with uh, Candela this year, but, uh, you know, that's okay. I mean, the, the industry's, you know, uh, unfortunately our industry's filled with, uh, with, with knockoffs and uh that's okay you know we'll, we'll, we'll keep coming up with good ideas and uh hopefully uh, uh just creating new segments in the marketplace it's great it's great so tom i want to give you a couple i want to hit a couple of quick points here um because we'd be remiss not to talk about michigan sports you're a huge michigan fan of the michigan teams so i'll hit you with a couple of quick ones um jim harbar you like the hire I love him, man. He's a Michigan guy. You know, he, he's been here most of his life. You know, his father was a coach here. Uh, so he was the little kid hanging out with Bo Schembechler. And then he came to college and played football here. And then obviously he's back a, a, as the coach. And he, he's a true Michigan man. And, uh, you know, he, he develops talent. And, and I think uh, the, the guy lives football. And, and he's great for the University of Michigan. So uh, we're, we're glad to have him. Awesome. What what happened to the Tigers this year? Oh, good job, man. <laughs> uh, you know, My father funny. was a, a Tigers fan, by the way. Yeah, so, what's yeah. funny is I, I just came, you know, we have the cigar bar in Comerica Park, the Asylum Lounge cigar bar uh, in the stadium. And uh, as a sponsor, I just did a golf outing with, uh, they do a golf outing to say thank you to the sponsors. So that, that's where I was today. We got to play Oakland Hills, which is uh, the, you know, they play the U.S. Opens and that kind of stuff there. So it was, a, it was a nice treat from the Tigers to take us out and get to golf with some of the old players. Al Kaline was there and Dave Rosma, Dan Petrie, a lot of the old guys, for, uh, Frank Tanana, a number of the old players that were on the 84 championship team. Uh, but, uh, you know, listen, we had a good run, obviously. They changed managers and the style changed a little bit and, uh, uh, you know, it just didn't work this year. And, uh, but I, I think they're very solid. You know, I think uh, Verlander's looked great the last uh, last six starts. I mean, he's getting back up to 99, 98 miles an hour. His arm, it looks like it's real lively again. So, uh, you know, we got Cabrera. We got Victor Martinez coming back. So we got J.D. Martinez coming back. So we got a really good group of guys coming back and uh the one thing i can tell you like they told us today is the one thing mike illich wants before he leaves this world is a world series and he's going to keep investing in the team and he's going to get new free agents next year and uh, I, I think we'll put a good product on the field and be back in the mix again next year yeah he's a great owner he's a great owner yeah. um yeah what's your outlook for the lions this year well, I think it's changed a little bit after the first two weeks. I, I, I had a little bit more of a positive outlook, and uh, they've started a little rough. Uh, but, you know, I, I think they still make the playoffs. I think uh, it's early in the year. The offense and the, the defense is, uh, uh, you know, needs to kind of come together. We got some new players on the defensive line. and uh, But I think they'll get it together, you know, I, with – Calvin Johnson, Golden Tate, and Abdullah, and we got some Stafford. We got good players, so they just got to put it together and 
we'll see what happens. I mean, you guys, the, the Matt Millen era was, had to be one of the darkest periods um, for you guys, though. So. <laughs> Listen, yeah. man, I, I, I mean, I, I'm born and raised in Detroit. I've been a fan my whole life. And I'll continue to be a Lions fan, but, uh, you know, we've won one playoff game in my entire life. My entire time on this planet. Dal- Lions- you beat Dallas, which was great. Yeah. And then I got- remember that game. Yeah, and then we got mopped by the Redskins in the in the championship game. Yeah. But, uh, you know, so let, I just want to see us get a playoff win under the belt, you know, and, and keep moving forward. And, you know, they're close. They were really close last year, and uh, we we're off to a slow start this year. But I think, uh, again, there's a lot of talent on that team. I think they'll end up putting it together. And uh, they got a tough task on Sunday night against uh, Peyton Manning and the Broncos uh, here in Detroit. But, I think uh, I think we'll see him get it done here. Good, good. And I got one more. Um, what can we expect with the Red Wings now that Babcock's uh, gone to Toronto? Uh, you know what, man? I, I think they'll be very good, man. They did great in the free agent market this year. They got uh, uh, Richards in, in, in green. They add some more defense. And, you know, our team is, uh, you know, last year I think there was only three guys on the roster that did not come through our farm system. So, you know, we've got great farm systems. Again, Mike Illich is willing to spend the money to bring in uh, uh, the best talent. And, uh, if the you know, I think goaltending is a huge key for us this year. We've got a lot of young defensemen that will be two, three years in now. And, uh, you know, I think they'll be a very, very competitive playoff team this year. I mean, they were close last year. I think, uh, you know, they should have beat Tampa Bay. They gave gave that game away. They were up 2 nothing and uh with five minutes to play and end up losing in overtime, and you can't give them away like that. But they'll uh, they'll be there at the end of the year this year, I think. I mean, I think their their team's solid, some really good young talent, and obviously Pavel Datsuk and Zetterberg are uh, uh, great players still as they get up in age, but they still are amazing on defense. And Pavel Datsuk is just uh, one of the best players to watch. You know, he, he's very good. Excellent, excellent. So, Tom, are you ready to play five questions with the Stogie Geeks? Sure. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to be doing this. Uh, <laughs> All right, three words to describe yourself. Big, fat, and ugly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Oh, good God. <laughs> uh, a 7 by 70. <laughs> nice. 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 <laughs> if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Wow. That's, what would the title be? Let's see. Um, that, that's a tough one. I think it would have to be something along the lines of, uh, uh, I, I think the book would have to be post, uh, post my death. So <laughs> I'm not put in prison for anything. <laughs> so let, let, let's see, postpartum, let's just call it uh, something along those lines, after <laughs> death. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? <laughs> I've never played that game, but uh, let's say first. Why not? All right. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Uh, Brad Pitt and Angela Jolie. Wow, you got that one right away. Hey, wow. That's sick. <laughs> Tom, uh, pleasure. it was really a pleasure having you on. I know we, we, it was a while getting this done on my fault more than anything, but uh, thank you so much for taking some time. Um, really appreciate it. Best of luck to you uh, to the rest of 2015 and 16, and I look forward to talking to you again on the show. Yeah, no, thanks, cool. Tom. It was great. No, no, it was great being on with both of you guys, and uh, I'm glad we finally got it done. And uh, that's a wonderful sweatshirt you're wearing tonight, William, and uh, go blue. There you go. All right. With that, we will take a short break and come back with the debonair ideal. <laughs> 